year with a, a student from Japan and a student from Italy. And there are some beautiful things that can happen when, when nations mix together and, and people mix together. So uh, here's an example of that uh, from Japan and America. This is Patsy Mink. In, in 1965, uh, she became the first woman of color in Congress. And she's a Japanese American, and that was, that was in 1965. And that's true also for Italy and America also. I was going down the list of Italian Americans and it's very long, um, but I settled on this. Uh, the combination of Italy and America gave us uh, Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone, pretty amazing. I could have gone with Leonardo DiCaprio for the next generation, but I didn't. But not just that. Um, I think that the mixing of Italian and Japanese cultures has also brought us greatness. <laughs> so we are enjoying the, the international mix of our house this year. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, with uh, school starting up and summer ending, I've been thinking a little bit about things that seem to end too soon. Um, so let me hear some ideas from people. What are, what are things that end too soon? Summer. 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 Oh, honeymoon's a good one. Summer. Brunch. Brunch? Vacations. <laughs> Vacations for sure. Eating, eating outside. Eating outside, that's great. Chocolates. Chocolates? <laughs> what ends too soon, Sophia? Um, play dates with my friends. with your friends, that's sermons. a great one too. <laughs> sermons? Definitely not sermons. Um, <laughs> So I did a little brainstorm uh, with the family, and we came up with a, a lot of the ones. Dessert, we would, we'd add to that. Sunsets, sunsets go too fast for sure. Um, pets, uh, a good book, you know, a visit from your friends. Um, a roller coaster, that one was a little controversial because for people who like roller coasters, yes, it ends too soon, but for people who are uncomfortable, it's, it's the opposite. Well, here's one that ended too soon for me. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes. So I'm sure almost everyone has, has read Calvin and Hobbes, has some experience of it, but I'd like show of hands from people who loved Calvin and Hobbes. How many do we have? Yeah, that's more than half the people get raised their hands for actually loving Calvin and Hobbes, and I was one of those people. So even if you love Calvin and Hobbes, you've probably never seen this man before. His name is Bill Watterson, and he is the person who wrote, who drew, uh, Calvin and Hobbes. And he's also one of the most private and secretive people that's, that is famous, probably, is how I describe him. He's lived his whole life in eastern Ohio. Um, he has zero interest in fame or in being, don in being known. There's only a couple of pictures, public pictures of him, even available. This picture was taken back when he was drawing Calvin and Hobbes. But he had a really fierce artistic vision of what he thought a comic strip should be. And he was so private, he, just, he would never come in public to talk about it. And uh, Calvin and Hobbes was a really big part of my life, starting with the, the time that I was eight years old is when this, this comic was, was first drawn. <laughs> and uh, this comic I'll walk you through in case you, in case you can't see. So Calvin, matter-of-factly at first, is saying, there's a new girl in our class. And so Hobbes is this tiger who is, who is Calvin's tiger. And to Calvin, he's alive. To everyone else who's around, uh, Calvin is a stuffed tiger who's not alive. But when it's just the two of them, Hobbes is always interacting with Calvin. So Calvin's saying, there's a new girl in our class. And Hobbes is saying, well, what's her name? And Calvin says, who knows? And Hobbes says, is she nice? And Calvin says, who cares? Not me. And finally, Hobbes is picking up on the defensiveness that Calvin is showing. And I love the grin on the tiger in that fourth belt. <laughs> Do you like her? And Calvin's going, no! <laughs> and I thought this strip was a great illustration of what made Calvin and Hobbes so special, to capture this dynamic, this dynamic of being a kid and what it's like to, to feel vulnerability and how Calvin's putting up his defenses even before, before Hobbes is even interested. And, it is Calvin's defensiveness that Hobbes becomes interested in because, because Calvin's being so defensive. And Bill Watterson had a gift for capturing what, what childhood is like. But I think what's made Calvin and Hobbes really last is that he also had a gift for showing what adulthood is like. Um, this is one of, my, one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes strips, and it's 
On Sundays, uh, Bill got more space to draw his comic, right? Instead of just the little three panel or four panel on the, in the Sunday newspaper. And in this one, um, I, there are no words. And so one of the gifts of Bill Watterson is that he could tell these incredible stories without using words at all. He would only use pictures. In this one, Calvin has noticed that it's snowing outside, and he's so excited to go play, but Calvin doesn't have a playmate. So now he's running outside to play by himself, and he begs for his dad to come out and play with him. And dad is busy. He's working at his desk. He has something that he has to get done. So he says no. And then a couple of, a couple of panels later, um, dad is looking at his work, and he's counting the cost of saying no to his son right then. And he puts down his work. Again, all of this is wordless. Uh, he puts down his work and he runs out to play with Calvin. And in the last scene, there's a couple of details that I love in the last panel. One of them is that Calvin's dad is back working. Like, the work had to get done. Cal he, he wasn't trying to hide from his son in the first place. He was just doing something that needed to get done. But the other is that uh, Calvin's mom is holding him for, for a kiss in the cheek. And Calvin, for all of, his, uh, all of his gifts, was not a very affectionate child. And it, feel, it felt really special in this strip, that this point of connection that, that Calvin is responding to. And uh, Bill was so gifted at this, at capturing these, these quiet moments, even, even without using words at all. On top of that, he had just endlessly creative art and stories. He had a number of uh, themes that he would return to with characters that Calvin would play or that others would play. Um, he had some amazing side characters, not only the parents, but teachers and so on, uh, including Miss Wormwood, who is named after uh, the devil in the screw tape letters by C.S. <laughs> Lewis. Um, there's, there's just so much there. But we're going to give you the tale of the tape here. So Bill Watterson drew over 3,000 of these cartoons. Um, they were in 2,400 different newspapers by the time the strip ended. So tens of millions of people would, would look at this comic every day uh, when it came out. Um, it ran from 1985 to 1995, so exactly 10 years is how long Calvin and Hobbes ran. Um, between now and then, Bill has sold 45 million books uh, of Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, at home, we have the, the four volume um, Calvin and Hobbes collection with every single cartoon and our, it's intergenerational. Adelaide loves it. Um, she, she quotes it to us all the time. And it's, it's amazing, lasting art. Bill Watterson was, had zero interest in his work ever being exploited or even used by anybody else. So much so that he refused to let it be licensed. So that means that's why you've never seen a Calvin and Hobbes TV show or a Calvin and Hobbes movie. You've never seen a Hobbes plush doll. You've never seen Calvin selling insurance like Snoopy does. Not that I'm naming any names. <laughs> um, Bill Watterson refused, refused to let his art be used that way. Uh, because of that, it's been estimated that he voluntarily gave up between 300 and 400 million dollars. Because Calvin and Hobbes was massive and there was a huge opportunity for him to cash in on the popularity. And Bill did it. In fact, not only did Bill not sell any licensing rights to Calvin and Hobbes, but when he was 37 years old, he stopped. And it came so suddenly to those of us who were reading Calvin and Hobbes carefully. Overnight, it felt like. There was a, a note in the paper, Bill Watterson saying, this week is my last week, and that was it. He was 37 years old, and he stopped. And the only retirement I can really compare that to was just a couple years before that, when, when Michael Jordan had won his first three NBA titles, and he was, he's 30 years old, and he's like, I've done it all, I'm walking away from the game. And everyone's jaw just falls on the floor, like, you're the best that there is. How can you just quit? How can you just quit? And for me, there was almost, I, had, I felt this disappointment about it. And I, in the stages of grief, I kept telling myself, maybe he's not really retiring, right? Maybe he's just, maybe he's slowing down. Maybe, maybe he can go back. Bill, listen, we want you to continue to do Calvin and Hobbes, so maybe you could just do Sundays. Like, we know you like the Sunday strips better. How about that? Or we'll give you a couple years off, and then, then you can come back and give us this thing that we love again. Like the idea that Michael Jordan would take his basketball away from us when he's at the very peak of his game. 
But Bill wouldn't do that. Bill was done, and he is done, and he has not drawn any more Calvin and Hobbes since, since, this, since 1995. Um, something that we missed when Bill was retiring was this. We didn't have visibility into what a burden it had become for Bill. So Bill has this uncompromising artistic vision of, of his strip and his art and his stories. When you get as big and as famous as Calvin and Hobbes got, what you do is you hire a team, right? You have a team of actually illustrators who help you, people who help propose stories. You don't keep doing this by yourself because no one can do this by, their, by themselves. Because a strip every day is a massive responsibility and to continuously churn out both the stories and the art is so difficult. But Bill wouldn't do that because he cared too much about what the art was. He did not trust it in anyone else's hands, even if he was the one supervising it. And Bill's hardly given any interviews since Calvin and Hobbes ended, but when he, he, he is always asked about, um, usually in writing, he won't, he won't do anything on video or TV. Um, he won't even let his voice be recorded. Um, but when he's asked about it, he's like, no, I retired at the right time. I was out of ideas. He said, he said repetition is the death of magic. And if I keep writing, if I would have kept writing this when I was done, you wouldn't love it like you love it now because the quality would have gotten worse and it wouldn't have been the same strip. And that's what Bill said. And yet, I still feel like something was taken away from me personally by a 37-year-old guy who's clearly at the peak of his creative powers just stopping and taking away this thing that I love. Shouldn't it have gone on forever? That's a good thing that was, that was just gone too soon. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Jeff was preaching about Stephen in the book of Acts. And for anyone who doesn't know the book of Acts, these are stories that happen in the life of Jesus, a life of the church, shortly after Jesus has departed. So it's the, the early stories that are happening in the church. And we meet, this, we meet this man named Stephen, and he appears kind of like Calvin and Hobbes did, like sort of out of thin air into the story. Suddenly there's this amazing person. So he's wise, he's full of faith, he's full of grace and power. He's so wise that he's picked as to be the person who's overseeing how they give food to poor people because he's going to be a, do a great job of making sure that everyone gets served so people really appreciate him. He's performing wonders and signs among the people. And we learn all these things in this very short bit of time in Acts 6. And then by Acts 7, Stephen is dead. So he comes onto the stage and we see what an amazing person he is and then he's gone. And it gets worse after he dies, I would say. So uh, the, uh, in Acts, it goes on to say, the, the crowd dragged Stephen out of the city and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. I think the wrong person is dying young here. <laughs> it shouldn't be Stephen who comes into this story with this blaze of, of joy and energy and ministry and purpose. It should be Saul who comes into this story watching people's coats so they can kill Stephen and then who leads teams going door to door to drag people into prison. That's the one who should be dying early. That's my human intuition about what should be happening here. That Stephen is, that Stephen is going too soon, but it should be Saul. But of course, something else about good things that end too soon is that sometimes there is purpose in it that we don't see at the time. And this same Saul, who is overseeing the death of Stephen, who is persecuting the church, he didn't know this at the time, no one else knew it at the time either, but he was about to have an encounter with God not too long after this. He was going to become one of the two most important leaders in the church. He didn't know that at the time. He was going to write letters to the church. In the end, he would write more books of the Bible than any other single person. That was Saul, not Stephen, who was destined for these things. But because of who he was before he did these things, our Saul, he never forgot. He never forgot what he had done with Stephen. 
And he said this in his letter to the Corinthians. I am the least of the apostles, do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he goes on to say in his letter to Timothy, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. It was because Saul had been who he was, and because he had been leading the persecution of the church, that this humility and this demonstration of God's power was lived out in him. And at the moment, it was Stephen who should have lived, not Saul, but we were wrong because there was an unseen purpose to what was happening in that moment, and a perspective on, on what it might mean when a good thing is going too soon. So here's a name that probably very few of you have heard. Um, this is after the events of the Bible. Um, so about 150 years after Stephen was killed, um, the church was spreading pretty effectively throughout the, throughout the Roman Empire, usually starting with the local Jewish communities, but then also spreading with Greeks and, and other kinds of people. And uh, it was starting to become a threat to the Roman Empire because some of these Christians would not offer sacrifices to the emperor um, or, to the, or to the Roman gods. And so there was a baptism class, and six people were in this baptism class. And I love this, it was a mix of men and women. It was a mix of free people and slaves. It was this eclectic mix of people that were in this baptism class. And the Roman authorities arrested all six of these people who were in this baptism class. And one of them was this woman named Perpetua. And Perpetua, we know the details about what happened because she kept a diary of her time when she was in prison. So when she was in prison, she was actually allowed to be baptized, which was a huge relief to her, um, as, as along with the other people who were in prison with her. But so we had this diary of her time and reading it again, I, I was struck that it's like, it, it's kind of like the first mommy blog as she's writing, <laughs> because she's, she has an infant, she's separating from her, separated from her infant now, like sometimes the infant will be brought to her, and Perpetua talks about the mastitis that she's experiencing as she's, as she's separated from the baby. It feels so real to hear her tell the story of, of what it's like for her in prison. While she's in prison, um, another, another woman who's in the group is a, is a household slave named Felicitas, who actually gives birth in prison. So now we have two mothers who are probably between the ages of 18 and 22 years old who are in prison. All six of these people are being threatened with death and are given opportunities to recant Christianity, to offer their sacrifices to the emperor. One time, Perpetua records that her father is brought in and they make her father beg her to recant her belief in Jesus. And, they, and her, her father is begging. He's, say, he's saying, do it for your son. You know, do it, do it for your child, even if you're not doing it for me. Do it for your baby. And she says, no, she won't do it. And then they beat her father in front of her, and that doesn't do it either. And in her, in her notes, uh, Perpetua talks, she, she reports on the dreams and the visions that she's having about this, about this last part of her life and, and what she should expect for her, her execution, which is upcoming. And uh, her, final, her final diary, uh, her entry ends like this. Perpetua writes, up until now, I've been the one writing this till the day before the games. But as to what happens at the games, let someone else write it. And someone else did write it, um, the account of what happens uh, to Perpetua and these other, this baptism class, it is recorded. And I think in a word, what happens is, it's outrageous what happens. Um, these are people who have done no harm to anyone. Two of them are young mothers with infants. And, you know, the word games is, is meaningful there. Like, the execution of criminals is entertainment at the time, right? This is, this, is, this is enjoyable for people. And they like to use wild animals to try to kill people on swords. And there's this, there's this plan to make it exciting for people to cheer. And I find that outrageous, of course. 
especially thinking about the, the young mothers who are there waiting this, <clears throat> awaiting the games. And I thought all of these things about Calvin and Hobbes and about um, Stephen and then also about Perpetua, um, I feel a sense of outrage about this, about a good thing that's ending too soon. And I propose to you that our outrage at loss is a clue to the meaning of the universe and something that we should be very attentive to when we're, when we're sad that things have gone too soon. So we feel the sense that something has gone wrong, right? When someone dies young or when something we love disappears or even when, even when summer's ending, there's a sense of disappointment that we feel about it. Good things ought to go on and yet they don't. And yet we know that their nature is to persist. We have this intuition that good things should last. In fact, people are so committed to the idea that good things should last that we do so much in human culture to try to make them last. Humans try to offer permanence to good things that should never end, but they do end in so many different ways, right? We, put, we make statues and idols of things to try to memorialize them, monuments and shrines. We revere our, our old heroes and the trailblazers of the things that we care about. We have debates about who is the greatest ever. We want our, our pets and our kids to stay exactly as they are. We want to try to do everything we can to keep, keep these good things from disappearing. And yet, it is completely futile. We have the sense that good things shouldn't end. We try to keep them together and we fail every time. There's a futility to keeping our good things. It's futile because only God is eternal. And only in being united with God could anything persist. Everything else, no matter what it is, is bound to fade and disappear and be forgotten. Only God is eternal. And we try so hard to hold on to these good things, but we fail. Our friend Saul writes in, writes in Corinthians, The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Something has gone wrong, not just with the world, but with ourselves. Because somehow, I keep being surprised. I keep being surprised when I lose good things. I keep being horrified and outraged when something ends too soon. And it doesn't matter how many times it happens, because my intuition about good things going on forever is so strong that this feeling of surprise never goes away for me. In fact, I'm constantly confusing this world with the world that should be. But the fact that we have this intuition that things have gone wrong, that things should be better, that tells us something about the universe, and that tells us something about who we are. How can we possibly make sense of this intuition we have that good things should keep going? and yet they don't. So we need an explanation of, of why that is. We need some kind of a story for why good things should last, but they don't. We need a story of the fall. And in the creation stories that different cultures have in the world, this is often a, a major element of them, is how did things go from being good to bad? Because in our, in our longing for good things to last, we have this sort of cultural memory that as something that came before the time that we're in now. And to make our lives worth living, when good things disappear, we need to have a sense of good news about it. We need to have the sense that there is some power out there that can take bad things and turn them into good things. And we need to have the sense that same, that same power can take good things and turn them into eternal things that last forever, that aren't subject to fading and decay and death. We need to believe that good things can be raised back to the eternity that they were meant for in the first place. Another thing that we need is a guide through this. We need a guide to help us see because we're not good at telling the difference between things that last and things that don't. Uh, things that matter and things that in the long run won't. We're really bad at that and we need help with that. So we need a guide to be attentive to what's last. The hope that we have in Jesus isn't that something has gone wrong. Anyone in this world can see that, that it's gone wrong. 
The hope that we have in Jesus is that something can go right. The hope we have in Jesus is that Jesus, by descending down into our human form like we are now, perishable and weak and subject, subject to the pain of the world, that the eternal God descends down into our perishable nature. That God has come down to where we are. But also that through his resurrection, that we can be joined to God's eternal nature. God coming down into what fails and what's disappearing and coming back up with us to rise to what's eternal and lasting. And our hope is that not that something has gone wrong, but that something can go right. And that's the story that, that we have in Jesus. First Peter 1 says this, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So we share a hope together. Uh, we, we recognize together that good things are meant to last. We recognize together that there is a power that can make them last. And we rejoice that it's not us. We don't have to make good things permanent by making a statue. And we don't have to make good things permanent by writing, the, writing a book or by writing a song. All these are good things, but they don't make good things permanent. But there is a power that does. And our friend Saul, who was there overseeing the death of Stephen, he wrote about this, about Jesus' last night alive when he instructed his followers uh, about communion. And so if you have your, uh, your small packets today, you can take them with me. Our friend Saul, the persecutor of Christians, says this, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Saul goes on to say, in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's close in a, a word of prayer. God, there are so many good things around us and we are so grateful for them. But more than that, we're grateful that you give us hope that it's not the nature of good things to, to fade away and to be gone but it's the nature of, of good things to be yours and to be raised back to you. And we pray with longing for, for your return to be raised to your, your wholeness and your permanence. And we're grateful so much that the eternal God chose to empty and to come down to be with human beings and the humility that was in that, how that changes everything for us. So we are grateful today, Lord, for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you please stand with us? Too?